a shamanic process that takes ones out of this these dimensions into a point where the person can almost look back at this dimension and put it into context but the important thing is that it's done in a nurtured um and in some state tribal environment in other words that has to be done with a lot of common sense a lot of compassion uh and that is the issue to me we if we're going to use these we have to be using them properly um and supporting people through this but it does seem to be a process where people's past trauma um can somehow put into context to such a point that their body is reset away from the, the, the post-traumatic stress and the complex post-traumatic stress somehow they've stood outside it and, and you know heroin addicts or whatever the same there's a higher success rate not perfect of course using these um compounds because they've stepped outside plato's cave to a certain extent i wanted to approach i kind of wanted to approach this this from the angle of i know last time we spoke we talked about your insights into eastern medicine and your journey through that and how it connected into your holographic universe theory specifically and, and the idea of the holographic universe and your thoughts on consciousness as a whole and in this one i kind of wanted to, to recapitulate the same thing but in a different way in relation to the human antenna um hmm. your secondary work and see what connections there are to be made between the field-based model of consciousness and how that actually interacts with the human person um because that's a kind of a big hard 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 thing to reconcile with of course so i wanted to see if we could start there and see what your thoughts were on that yeah um i suppose uh, this the human antenna was my second book um and i suppose i can explain it by saying that it uh, appeared to me that um through our lives we 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 should our awareness and our consciousness should grow and that um i based this sort of sort of on an understanding of the vedic um principles of the chakras uh and i tried to point out that this i found was quite helpful in helping people uh, with their ailments um simple example you know if they're having a problem with their throat or thyroid are they, are they being heard um uh, are they expressing themselves if they're having some problems in their guts you know uh, or the mid middle part of their body uh, are they trapped uh, maybe in middle management or in a relationship yeah. that uh, so to me that made a lot of sense and my, my first book was um really reconciling chinese medicine and the um, meridians and uh, some of the deeper issues deeper philosophies like zhang fu with my practice of medicine and both of these books were really there saying that there's no conflict these are just other ways of looking at things and they can be terribly helpful in explaining to people and giving them further insights into meaning behind their condition particularly it's a chronic condition and yes i think that so in chinese medicine to go back to that um traditionally we are energy first and that our physical form uh in fact grows on our energetic profile um and similarly with ayurvedic understanding uh that's that's true and i suppose both are are joined with an understanding that what we call consciousness isn't just our waking consciousness that we are filters of consciousness of something greater than we just uh, can perceive with our senses uh and in fact when we are probably at our most healthy we probably do have a feeling that we are not time dependent uh even the feeling of being loved cannot be measured in time and space uh i also believe that creativity comes through us that it isn't just based on uh, all our past experiences so in other words we're talking about a primacy of consciousness mm -hmm. and in the human antenna um which i call the human aerial in this in in new zealand and england 
mainly because they understood an aerial was the thing you put on top of your TV in the old days, right. <laughs> that we were receivers of consciousness and filters. Um, and uh, that corresponded to not only the traditional Chinese understanding, Ayurvedic, but also some of the theories from Stuart Hameroff, uh, Roger Penrose, yeah. on uh, you know the microtubules in the brain. Are they the foundries of, uh, uh, are they the place where uh, some of these other realities uh, collapse down into our own reality here? Um, so when I wrote The Human Antenna, it was really that we were receivers of this consciousness that we had in our, when we are a healthy, we um, are able to probably step aside from time and space and just have a good time. I say that when we're having a good time, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're measuring it in, in minutes and hours. It's a moment in time. It is a time uh, where we are probably not thinking too much of time, uh, a feeling of being at one. I noticed in a certain number of people when I was doing acupuncture, and I've done that since 1981, that they can um, get into this state where they feel um, totally relaxed, but also at peace and somehow at one with their surroundings. Um, and that is great because it means we are probably feeling our best, almost blissful. But also we have to be cautious because if they're driving home, I say to them, well, you have to be cautious yeah. Yeah. because you're living in a very 3D uh, time, space, yeah. dangerous environment. Uh, and so the same as when you're meditating, you know, you come out of that and then you enter back into the real world, probably somewhat like Plato's cave, <laughs> where you know you're in this real world. Uh, and, but, and somehow as we grow, we, we actually, through this process, of understanding that there's another level to our being, what David Bowen would say, the implicate order, and this is the explicate order. I find that we honor these dimensions, we honor the world, we honor our relationships, and very much that this world becomes um, magnificent in some ways, and we want to protect it. And people who have gone through near-death experiences and out of body experiences where they have actually escaped this time space, if you like, when they do return, often with pain, they also return with us with a, probably a will to live a life that um, helps others and protects the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you've got you've got that, and everything then becomes a wonder, uh, and looking around becomes a wonder. I don't know if that's answered your question, yeah. but it's sort of, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. But that's the way that I probably somehow understand my my understanding of this word consciousness, which everybody has a different understanding with, with um, these models of health. And also what I'm reaching for and the person coming to me is reaching for is a level of health that is above what they've experienced. <laughs> Uh, whereas we're in it working in a system where we're trying to react and fix things but we're not necessarily encouraging the person to this get to this level of being um which is a place of both love but also um protection you the you can have it both ways you have to have it both ways we have mm -hmm. to live and do stuff in this world but at the same time we can step aside step out of plato's cave occasionally yeah. before we go back in um and tap back into what we're and this gives us meaning in life and what we're doing in life yeah so that's that yeah yeah that's a great answer to the question that kind of captures all the elements of it um consciousness as trying to get to a definition is very difficult um sometimes especially but that's a great capture of the whole picture the the in the exterior the interior um and the way that i see it um an interesting part that you bring up is the instillment of virtue and the way in which virtue is taught and passed down in Plato's symposium. You know, it's kind of they talk about the origins of virtue and it's interesting to see their 
dialogues around the nature of virtue originate to the fact that it's some kind of remembered component. It's almost like a it's impossible for it to be student to teacher in, in formal academic manners. And so that's an interesting conclusion that, that we often forego as something that's kind of minute, but really it's a big conclusion to draw because once you draw on that, you're admitting to a metaphysical reality that must exist if you can remember virtue. Um, and, and, and yet we all kind of innately think that we do. I mean, we all kind of know that there's a, um, an innate pulling oh, just aside from homeostasis that pulls you towards things external that aren't sometimes not even in your best interest, but are in the better interest of a higher thing. So you're kind yes. of that, that prioritization. And so one, one thing that I kind of sp I spin from your work that's very, that's very unique in the angle that I'm taking is a way to indicate to people that even in a platonic, almost secular look at the world and the universe, you can come to a virtuous conclusion or kind of like a virtuous conclusion. And so I think with my, with your work, what I, what I try to extract out from it too, is, is a standpoint from how you could really reach, reach a secular or a, more of a platonic angle with something that remains spiritual. Yeah, I think so. You know, that's when we can go into the Golden Mean um, Fibonacci series. You can actually mm -hmm. see patterns in the world. You can see patterns in a shell, for instance, uh, which can be the same as the pattern inside your ear. You can see the bronchial tree and you can look at a tree. And somehow from that, you can deduce there's a connection that mm -hmm. we have um, that is being represented in this geometry. Uh, but there's something what's behind this geometry why um yeah even the dna has the same proportions yeah. as uh <laughs> certain nebulae out here, you know so, and, and galaxies and um i think that's really important because people have to find their own way and i think it's why it's so nature is so important uh, and being in nature and being aware and looking around and putting everything into context and when people feel good, I think that's what they, they do. They feel in a sense of wonder. You don't have to know all about it. It's I'm trying to instill in people, you don't have to find the answer because we keep searching for the answers. Uh, but live more in a state of wonder. Um, and, it, you know, in this day and age, it is not easy. There's so many distractions, not least of them being the handheld devices where people are looking at a small two-dimensional screen. It's what what are they missing around? What is the context <laughs> that they're missing? Yeah. And that yeah. screen, of course, has a motive of probably extracting something, attention, and ultimately money out of them, I suspect. So um, I suppose this is much of my teaching now. It's not, look, I'm not preaching. I'm just yeah. sort of trying to live this life too. So um i can set some sort of small example yeah uh, by doing it and, and also i point out how difficult it is uh, i'm not i'm never saying i'm finding it easy or that i succeed in all this i am distracted um and in the last few years we've been terribly distracted but the same instance um it seems to be essential to what i call real health this is yeah. a state of being and um, comfort uh, and and love, you know, it, it can't put uh, too much emphasis on on the word love. Yeah, no, I, and that that's exactly what what I, I mean. That's how I feel about it as well. Of course, I I, I mm. fall short of all of these these things mentioned. It, but but there, I find that it's increasingly um, prevalent that people have kind of a. You mentioned the pursuit of meaning, and that's kind of at a a level that seems to kind of be weird right now and uh, for people to find where that meaning lies and how to hone in on it. And I think that looking at consciousness as at least a vital force that kind of promotes creativity and kind of mm. adds um, vitality to the, to the situation as, as opposed to just a really grounded nihilistic materialism that kind of rests really low, it at least provides us a, a route kind of out of that. And one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about just on the science side of it, I found that was very kind of, um, confirming of your thoughts. Um, I didn't know if you'd heard of a gentleman named Dr. Michael Levin by chance, but he's a, have you heard Carry of him? On, yeah. Yeah. Karen explained, I know the name. So yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Some of his work is, um, I started re reading, reading through it and basically it's, it's kind of providing this, um, playbook or blueprint behind the or how cells and, and um, come together to form their actual shape and size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because otherwise DNA just kind of is this material, but doesn't provide 
the instruction manual for assembly. And so he kind of has honed in on what that instruction manual looks like in the form of kind of um, an intercellular matrix, kind of like you kind of like your your thoughts kind of come come to. Um, and I thought it was really confirming of of some of these thoughts. And I just thought you might be interested in hearing it because in, in his discovery, he discovered that there is this field that that pervades the cellular networks and it's even mm. sub it's even cellular intelligences that are can actually mm. be spun off of it and kind of recreated a new creature almost um and he he shows this by this like um i think he calls them non-neural electric fields bioelectric fields that are being discovered yeah. and they're they're kind of intensive and i just wanted to see if you heard about that and also yeah, what yes. your thoughts are. yeah um i'm not exactly sure exactly his work but yeah the, the, this about four years ago, um, science, uh, uh, normal reductive science, discovered uh, this part of our body called the interstitium, um, and they would say that's the biggest organ in the body, and it's the connective tissue. And basically, it hasn't been discovered before because once you try to extract this, dissect the body, take it out, it dissolves. Just like so many things, they disappear under the microscope when you put them in take them out of the context of the body but this this is the tree of connective tissue which probably closely associates and i think it is the same thing as our meridian system um and yeah. it's not only connective tissue because it binds the cells together but it also is is a um, electrical um conductor and uh it it runs through the body and it has because it's fractal in nature it has little branches and little twigs that go into every cell. And when I was at medical school, I asked the question, I saw a cell divide. Everybody knows this picture of the spindles pulling the nucleus as a side in cell division and mitosis and the two cells. are. Yeah. And, and I, I asked, I said, well, what's pulling these cells? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't ask. Um, and, and, and this network would be running through the body and also into the brain um, into the microtubules now the brain cells don't divide in the same way we keep them for a longer time uh, and that tends to fit into uh hammeroff's and penrose's idea yeah. uh, of the microtubules there because these are all microtubules by the way mm -hmm. uh the spindles are microtubules or whatever which are the so instead of them all dividing they can be the foundries of receiving consciousness, it cuts a long story short, and helping to convert it into something that we can understand this. In other words, collapsing down, they would say of quantum fields, but you know, maybe it's beyond quantum fields too. Yeah. So <clears throat> this makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. in my work, I don't know if you've ever had acupuncture, but basically you're just putting little conducting pins into people and you're connecting them to a greater whole to the outside and through that there tends to be a state of relaxation and i still think that probably the most useful thing having done it for 40 years is to get people out of fight or flight into you know a more relaxed parasympathetic rather than sympathetic system um, and in that state i have found myself that i have ideas and i can be more creative um and i can and people find that as well they find that then they and could this be due to the fact that we're somehow got this organism in balance electrically that we're not overthinking and that the consciousness can flow through we can put ourselves into a better perspective uh in this world which means and context in this world um yeah and and so that's what that's what makes sense so that is the interstition people can google it of course it's created a lot of debate because there are a lot of scientists who don't really believe in the body's energy system and the fact that word makes them laugh and snigger sometimes mm -hmm. um and it's a challenge for them for that, for, for that. Mm -hmm. but these are just my observations and it's an their observations that i think eventually help people i mean they're yeah. really that's my job it's so that they walk out of my rooms with some hope but also a perspective on themselves that there's something more to them than just sort of meat packages um yeah. and yeah, of course this idea that's being pushed all the time that chemicals will help us 
you know, especially in the last few years, yeah. has to be put into context. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot yeah. more than that. Yeah. So, so um, to me, this way of thinking, whether it's right or wrong, seems to be helpful for people um, and gives them hope. And it also, as many people would know, those people who have had near-death experiences of out-of-body experiences, alongside that, they tend to fear death less. Um, and, And it seems to, once you reduce your fear and you value your time here, that is not to say you'd want to die, but the fear of death is something that has been used against us, mm-hmm. particularly in the last few years. I have to be careful what I say, but it's that fear of death has, is very controlling. Um, oh, yeah. And I, you know, I, I see people come to me and I, I do a lot of terminal care. I was a hospice director for some time. And basically, there's a process when many people are dying where they become, go into a state of acceptance and many will be there reassuring other people who aren't le- ready yet yeah. <laughs> that they're all right and that they haven't got this fear. Um, so alongside this work, there's often the advantage of people fearing death less. No, it doesn't mean you're going to walk in front of a bus. It doesn't mean you're going to be suicidal and it doesn't mean you're not going to enjoy life, but it seems very interesting. And of course, when we get into consciousness, does consciousness survive death and everything? um, It's not just reassuring. It seems to have some other level of um, bringing peace to people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, No, that's a, that's an angle. I didn't think about it's compassionate care use kind of in a way, I guess I would say it. Um, I think that's the name of some act in the U S but, um, if you wanted to administer compassionate care in a hospice situation, these practices could lead to an acceptance of death mm. um, such that the de- dying process itself would be maybe easier. And I think, mm. interestingly enough, that goes hand in hand with the work in anesthesia that Roger Penrose does is yes. his work, his work kind of sure. yeah. Roger. I mean, uh, Stuart Hammeroff Stuart, is the anesthesiologist. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then they're, the they're, yeah, they're co-mingling <laughs> together has created the great Orco R conception, which yeah. like you yeah. mentioned earlier is a, is a compelling theory and it aligns perfectly with probably a lot of the insights you develop in your books. And, mm-hmm. and that that's the notion that microtubules serve as some sort of quantum, almost quantum interface between the classical and the quantum. And this being observed uh, scientifically, I mean, in lots of cases, well, moving forward, student Hammeroff is the anesthesiologist who thought, Oh, well, let's administer anesthesia and see the effects it has because obviously if it's removing consciousness its impact upon it would be rather discerning we could tell pretty quickly what's conscious and what's not and so how i got to the from there i went i got to the idea that consciousness must pre-exist brain because Mm -hmm. they were able to anesthetize single cellular organisms and that blew my mind because i was like well if you can anesthetize a single cellular organism but it's not asleep so that means consciousness can be removed even from a single cell. So to me, at that point, it guaranteed consciousness pre-existed cellular intelligence, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and and like, like amoeba-like substances, paramecium, uh, which don't have any brains at all, still mm-hmm. have a consciousness when they come against something. They they, they divert yeah. to another place, you know. So um, yes, brains are are useful obviously as both filters <laughs> and, yeah. and the very complicated structures uh but they may not be the seat of our consciousness they may be um uh, subtly allowing us to be in this life uh, you know the, the, i went on after the human antenna into into something called the human hologram which takes it a bit further so rather than saying we are here and the consciousness comes through us we are integrally ho- holographically uh, yeah. entwined in a non-local way with the universe and that we are um, some faction or f- fractal within that and our consciousness is now this is uh, because early in this century and I think it was the uh, scientific American and the new scientist they cover they had a, a cover article of of yeah are we holographic and it had uh, the image of um, people us human beings walking through fields of consciousness, if you like. Okay. To which, and the question I had is, well, no, we're part of that field of consciousness. Maybe we are 
in that field maybe we are that field it still looked like there was separation if you like yeah yeah um and i developed that and it was quite it's quite it's obviously a hard concept um but in the same thing it, it once you get it you can become as i said before wondrous about the world you can you can look at the stars you can see you can even the newtonian einsteinian physics can make sense to a certain point mm -hmm. But we can also sort of understand a little bit more about the timelessness of compassion and and um yeah and and, and it puts our lives in in, in, in the in context i i do believe we're only touching on this i i'm not hopefully and arrogant enough to feel that <laughs> we know it all i i, I think we know a millionth of a millionth of, of all this but it's it it's certainly logical and it certainly has a huge impact it has in my life and and um it makes it just makes everything interesting in the world <laughs> everything it does yeah yeah you know, it, it very much so does have you one of the things i wanted to touch really quick just on that on the fear of death on the fear of death thing mm. you were talking about what's interesting is we see a lot of commonalities between eastern practices that produce states of oneness it seems like and yeah. also the psychedelic experience that produces a similar transcendent state and in most of those psilocybin studies they did do and it, that have conducted thus far have indicated a success rate or not a success rate yeah. but a, a rate of like 85 statistically significant um figures um indicating that the same effect had happened on those people where they had basically reported a year later a complete absence of fear of death um and it's that's what that that's where the rubber heats the rubber kind of hits the road on this matter for for what you're talking about is this can change people's perspectives on on life in such a drastic manner that simply overcoming the fear of death can lead to a richer life is what i interpret kind of what you're saying oh yes absolutely and and it's interesting the shamanic practices um, so as Ivan, as you say, um, the uh, ayahuasca uh, and the psychedelics, this is the way our mental health and health services could have gone in the 70s. But obviously, it had a bad rap in those days because of um, a lot of the acid trips. And I suspect, you know, people too young and our egos too big to cope with it. But it, it's one of the things that I think is going to be very important in the next decade, I hope even sooner. Um, the Imperial College which in, in London, um, uh, doing a study, as you probably know, of using intravenous um, uh, psychedelics uh, in a study. And many, many universities are doing this. And Australia has just opened its doors to, um, oh. uh, uh, to, to therapies. Now, my view on this is that um, a shamanic process that takes ones out of this these dimensions into a point where the person can almost look back at this dimension and put it into context. But the important thing is that it's done in a nurtured um, and in some state tribal environment in other words that has to be done with a lot of common sense a lot of compassion uh and that is the issue to me we if we're going to use these we have to be using them properly um and supporting people through this but it does seem to be a process where people's past trauma um can somehow put into context to such a point that their body is reset away from the, the, the post-traumatic stress and the complex post-traumatic stress. Somehow they've stood outside it and, and, you know, heroin addicts or whatever the same. There's a higher success rate, not perfect, of course, using these um, compounds because they've stepped outside Plato's cave to a certain extent and they've looked back at their life and they've put their life into context and they've often put their life and their ancestors and what they've taken on from previous generations in context too. Uh, and this is hugely important, not just not the shamanic process, but this understanding for young people who are feel lost uh, with meaningless, feeling of meaningless lives, even to the point of young men and women committing suicide because they can't see the point, they can't connect. 
I'm not saying they should by any means all go on to LSD uh, treatment or whatever. But it, it, I have found that um, if we discuss the bigger picture, what was their fathers doing, their grandfathers doing, were their great grandfathers going to war at the same time as they're having these feelings? Uh, were previous generations, uh, did they actually pass without resolving their uh, trauma? And, and somehow, because we know that can be passed on. And does this give meaning to where they're going through now? If they heal and we help them heal, are we helping their ancestors heal? This is traditional in Maori culture. You know, it's, it's, and I have found when we have a discussion like this, particularly with young men who have been depressed or anxious, it, it gives them another sense of, of meaning um, and focus in their lives. Um, and yeah, it puts them into context with their ancestors. Yeah. Uh, I, I see. And I and, said, yeah. Does and, that make sense? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and <laughs> what, it, what it actually, yeah, it definitely makes sense, uh, mm. in my opinion. Um, and I think the, uh, I think something that strikes me as interesting there that you say it's that disconnection from their lineage, sometimes disconnection from their past. I heard a, a like some kind of capture of the same sentiment by one of the a podcasts I listened to recently, and they said something like, when the act of something becomes divorced from its telos or from its teleology, yeah, weird things start happening is how he put it. Um, but what he means by that, in my opinion, I think is, is what you're saying is this, this is disconnection from you came from somewhere and you're going somewhere causation leading to a final yeah. cause that the yeah. divorcing of an action in the world from that pattern of behavior that's going towards the proper telos, like a divorce from those two things causes um, havoc because then you're you're taking some things that are supposed to be hierarchically maybe higher in, in, in sacredness or whatever um something more purposeful something more actualizing and i think maybe this pursuit of actualization that's been such a common theme of psychology where it's this idea mm -hmm. of pursuing actualization well potentially there's all this potential that's left unactualized because of the inability to locate the telos mm -hmm. Or the or the final end of what this so if you stay even in sexual culture or in drug culture or any of those things, you start seeing all kinds of weird things happen when you divorce the act from its from and it goes back to the, the psychedelic thing is that if you take it out of the shamanic tradition, you're divorcing mm -hmm. the act from the the telos of the whole thing. And there's something mm -hmm. interesting kind of about that that forming a connection to some kind of final end or cause seems to be critical for people's well being too maybe. Yeah, I, I I think so. But even just having the discussion like this, and I'm uh, I'm sort of a lot of people coming to me. I wouldn't, and on first glance, feel that they wouldn't grasp this. But far from it. They not only do they grasp it, but they come up with insights that I never had, and oh, yeah. they teach me. You know, they they teach me, and they come up with that uh, with with a, a deeper understanding of meaning. And and yeah, it, it, it's. Um, you know, the, we talk a little bit about what's happening in the world at the moment um, with instant gratification, what I call the TikTok world. Um, yeah. It, it, to find and an context, you know, that we have now, we have this chat GPT, as you know, where yeah. you can potentially give AI a, a a topic and it'll write an essay or you can start a song and it'll finish it and however um that concerns me i, I think yeah. it'll find its place but it's so important that as i say in the human antenna it's the challenges in life that actually um help us grow uh the mistakes we make we carry on we we, we blunder through things but it would i think the biggest issue is that if everything becomes just the press of a button not only will it somehow undermine the amazing creativity of each person you know it will actually deflect from them doing their own work but somehow uh it, it'll could interfere with this um unraveling that we're doing in this life you know um but giving it meaning you know, so every time there's a we're challenged, it is a challenge mm -hmm. for us to somehow get through and to grow through, you know, um, 
That's so true. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I brought up some big issues that I think that are challenges today yeah. and why so many young people, and I, I work in student health as well, oh, okay. um, are, have um, anxiety and depression and this thing called ADHD, which means that they have you know concentration issues and how the answer to that has been a, a cocktail of drugs which i don't think you know they they haven't worked out whether they're ever going to come off those um i just i constantly battle this because i constantly know that those people haven't had the chance to sit down for half an hour to have this sort of discussion Mm -hmm. um and they are they will get it they can get it on certain levels i'm sure that if we did that and we did that better um yeah the the drug well the big pharma wouldn't be probably quite so profitable yeah that's that's another unique angle or just not a unique angle but a, but a very important angle is that yeah big pharma in in the western world of course is is a giant monster and so eastern practices as they as they become more as they become more discussed such conversations as you and ourself myself are having um it does no disservice to others who come across this as a um in the form of understanding the alternative routes that are out there that are based in like a more holistic understanding of the of the mm -hmm. human person but what i wanted to ask you about just really um just to cap just to carry um dovetail off of what you just said I think that's an, a critical point too, that there's like a value, there's a value that has to be placed on the net, the suffering and the sacrifice that people give. And, and, and if you start to try to displace all the suffering that's inherent to existence with constant dopaminergic pleasure sensor, sensory data all the time, it becomes almost the expected norm that that's actually the meaning of life. It seems to me like there's this fundamental disconnect between the ability to understand that dopaminergic pleasure isn't all the way center of the mass here. Um, and the pur purpose of that is just, I say that what you say by overcoming trials and suffering and things like that is almost, almost like now that's been even kind of, kind of removed because suffering seems to be an option rather than something that's inherent to formation of character as you just identified. Yeah. It, it's interesting because although I say that, uh, my primary work is to try to reduce suffering. So yeah. um, I would love it for us to evolve to a point where um, life is constantly um, rewarding uh, and joyful. Uh, and I wish that on people and my children, grandchildren. But um, I think we're away from that. I think that helping them through their suffering um, is the best we can do at the moment and to understand it and to somehow impart that uh, every cloud has a silver lining you know just the uh, the yin yang you know the, the white dot in the in the black corner in yeah. the black side um uh, not always and there's a time to say that obviously one shouldn't belittle their, their suffering in any way absolutely but not. No. yeah um you know i know i also to start doing some poetry and I sing and I, I have a, another career as a singer and what strikes me is that there are two types the voice can be captured with a microphone and a, a, in the old days an analog microphone mm -hmm. and our voice uh, the analog voice is not perfect but it carries with it um, our past and it carries with it uh, our faults and it carries with it um who we are one could say the soul but of course what happens now is we digitalize something and you know even recording the, there's this auto tune where you press a button and every note <laughs> sits completely on yeah. that note okay now the best singers in the world um will will vibrate around uh, a note okay and if you're a blues singer you'll just be under <laughs> under that you you will purposely uh go um either sharp or or, or, or the other way for an yeah. emotion um and there's a temptation now for art to be sanitized <laughs> and digitalized uh huh, that's interesting yeah 
and and the voice to be. I know we're we're through this amazing medium, and I'm not I'm not saying this isn't amazing. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it has talk to you the other it. side of the world. It's totally amazing. Yeah, it uh, is. But again, we put it in context. Somehow we can use this to explain these issues. Um, uh, and and there are some philosopher scientists who talk about um, quantum epigenetics. With another word, what it is it about oh. the world outside that affects that can affect our genes and our expression of genes. Yeah. And they talk about that being more analog because analog, you can digitalize and divide everything up into bits, but it doesn't carry compassion and love and all these other areas, um, probably below, beyond quantum. Uh, yeah. So wow. again, that you get back into um, the creativity, the fact that our creativity, and if we do something creative, it isn't perfect. It actually carries with it um, <laughs> some real problems. You know, yeah, yeah, it leaves in its wake a trail of potential disaster. Yeah, every every good song has a chord that shouldn't quite be there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Every, exactly. And every, um, every silver lining got a touch of gray, kind of like you were saying. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you've ever done any sort of... Uh, an improv work um I didn't <laughs> no, that. Not I wasn't myself. very good at it have you done some improv yeah I have not yeah. I have not but I really enjoy it I want in watching it I mean yeah I I did it because it's first thought and the biggest laugh comes you just say something <laughs> and um it's usually amazing if you mess up you mess up big um yeah yeah and most <laughs> most of the good stuff is totally unintentional um it's worth everybody doing an improv course I assure you um, there's some people brilliant at it. I, I was very average at it, but I, I, I wanted to use it so I could be spontaneous a bit more. Um, yeah, yeah. But again, that's the wonder of of uh, uh, some connection that is happening that is totally unexpected. Yeah, that makes life so interesting and so rewarding. You know, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it, it very much is. And uh, one of the you bring up music there and. Um, I'm no musician by any means, nor do I have a grasp of music theory. But in your in the subtitle to your book, which is my the favorite part of, I, I like the, yeah. the subtitle of your book, "The Reading a Language of the Universe and the Songs of Ourselves." I like that because it gives us a, it's like a capitulation of how to view the world. The reading meaning yeah. text, language, song. Yeah. It's almost like you've got the three. Because the way I've been conceptualizing consciousness lately has come to a tri a triune relationship yeah. between between different aspects of reality and i'm not even saying this in a christian context specifically i'm saying yeah. this in kind of um some weird synthetic way that i've been kind of just bouncing around in my brain but but for for me to think about it, it's like music provides some but i don't have the knowledge of music necessary to know what parts of it probably connect but i know that music seems like it tells a narrative or tells almost a story through the way it's constructed if you look at like symphonies and things of that nature and i i i wonder when you say sing the songs of ourselves and things like that i think there's something truly harmonious about the whole thing of this that it, it is a, like almost a harmony where if everything is in octaves and octave seems to me like a hierarchy kind of thing i wanted to ask um just because you mentioned music if you don't mind what what you think think that looks like kind of and if you think that makes sense yes i do i do and that I, oddly enough, uh, and I didn't know it was going to go this, I, I wrote a very short poem on this, um, because poems tend to be, you know, and, and I, I introduce them and I, I do sing and I'm with a band and um, uh, when we have a wonderful female singer and I wrote this for her, so when the singer becomes the song, when the singer becomes the song, then love is in the air to land on everyone, no matter who or where. When the singer becomes the song, there is no time or space, no crisis, short or long, no room for bitter taste. When the singer becomes the song, then shadows disappear, and a light outshines the sun through the, pr through the prism of a tear. When the singer becomes the song, this I know is true, the world becomes as one, and I become as you. Wow, that's beautiful. That is, um, that is excellent, absolutely beautiful. And, and I suppose I'm saying that is, is I'm finding um, poetry expresses things better than I can sort of explain in a straightforward, logical way. Yeah. Um, and, and 
because every word is important, but every the rhythm of the word is important. Yes. Um, and a song can produce a tear, which is a connection to um, some reality. It's not because it's necessarily miserable or sad. There's some, I'm a singer-songwriter, so some of my songs are miserable and sad. Um, but yeah, ultimately, yeah. it usually comes as a personal connection. Um, and again, my focus is that this is the way we need to continue to evolve. We mustn't be sidetracked. We can use, certainly we can use um, artificial intelligence. We can, you know, we can scroll through things more quickly. We can book holidays online. It's all marvelous. Uh, but we must never lose that. We never lose the poetry um, that's within us. And and there are certain scientists that say, yeah, look, the reality of science is much closer to, to poetry um, than it is to uh, sort of linear um, textbooks. Yeah, I think something, strangely enough, I've happened onto a similar sentiment about the nature of poetry in general. And I don't know, I don't know where its origins lie, but that's what brought me to this conclusion on music was I started writing a poem one day out of nowhere. Yeah. And as I was doing that process of writing this poem, which I've never done before, really, I don't think I've ever written a poem. Well, it became a poem and whatnot. And hmm. and then I, I read through it and it was it was almost seemed like it was laying out some truths that were incapable of being expressed unless you paired together two distinct opposites in such a context that they synthesize something better out of them. It's hmm. like if you take, and this is a conclusion I came to, and then I realized that, oh, well, this seems like if you don't have this, you can tell when the rhythm is off by reading it, by just hmm. reading it. You don't need the music or the composition background behind it, but you hmm. can tell innately to the, the expression and the written context of the language that there's some kind of unique universal truth that can only be revealed by like a weird formation of fiction and and, and uh, fact or something. Yeah, it is. It's beyond that and and when you're writing um there's this wonderful thing that just sort of flows through you but you also know we're good poets people that are more experienced than me every word is is right somehow it's been plucked from out there yeah. i don't think it's been plucked from alexa or or whatever in <laughs> fact i don't use a yeah. thesaurus because it's sort of no a cheating no. i think you know no, that's a weird um, thing, yeah. it's not the right thing and and mm. it needs yeah and again, you know, this is so almost. important for us. Uh, the, what I like about poetry is that it, it sort of fits in with our lifestyle because rather than opening a book and, and you know, knowing that you're going to take a week to read that book or longer, a poem can be just uh, so short and easy to read now. And you can go back into, into it um, many times. You can go back and find different meaning on it. So again, it's the poetry of life that um fills me and uh yeah and i you know give it a go um that's one of the few poems that actually rhyme most of my that, my, i like I that a lot i like the prism of a tear line a lot yeah that's a you see that's what i like about poetry is being able to bring together something like a prism which is just a regular object and yeah. a tear but everybody knows there's something deeper down there about the tear yeah. the prism there's so you know yeah. people think of the pink floyd album cover people yeah think yeah yeah, yeah stuff, exactly yeah. which is really cool so i think yeah there's something about the juxtaposition of language together and i guess i was wondering i, I i've been wondering if there's something in music theory that backs up of mathematically how a song yeah. is to be written and if if that's the case does it have any application to the to the world but um yeah it's well, the that... sacred geometry and pythagorean theory oh, of um I, I work I, somebody in my band really knows a lot more about this than myself in some ways i i don't want to be too prescriptive in it i'd rather <laughs> yeah. it just came through and um once you can get too too knowledgeable i think it can become boring oh, uh for, as as a creator um absolutely i agree so, but but you know i i we have a local market here and i've started a a store called a real place called Albany, which is in not just in New York, called Albany Creative, and and it just encourages people to come up for five or ten minutes um, and just say their piece. They can tell a poem, they can read a story, they can tell a joke, they can juggle, they can do a magic trick, or they can come and explain if they're a craftsperson at at the market their um, creative inspiration mm -hmm. and what it is that. Uh, has made this match or this uh, whatever this candle or, or whatever everything is important um, 
and not so much just that that'll promote them, of course, but it'll also, I hope, open the door to um, inspire people to to be creative and well to know that they're, cre- they're, they're they have creativity which yeah. can satisfy them and it can doesn't matter what you do you know you can make thimbles you can make whatever but it's yeah. it's the same process you know yeah yeah making something seems to be a big portion of why we're here it's or it does it does it that's definitely a great take on how to solve a crisis of meaning if there is a, ever to be had one you can ultimately notice that there's always a lack of creative energetic energy being being understood that yeah. it's there and needing somebody to point people in the direction that it is there and that they do possess it and that it's just the allocation of that attention in the right way will spark mm-hmm. it all for people and i think that that creative instinct isn't just it doesn't seem to me to be confined to any one person it's just a kind of a, a belief and enthusiasm in the right area and knowing mm-hmm. what that area is it seems to me to be very beneficial for people and it's a hard thing to find it's people because people's lives are full of suffering and so i think yeah. people like yourself the views and the things that we're, we talk about and you talk about in your medical practice is such a needed angle because it bri- provides that compassion that's absent from a lot of stuff. So anyway, saying all that, I just wanted to say I like your work for that at, at that extra added reason is that virtue is at the center of it. a lot of what you say and a lot of your doctrine and virtue is uh, often short changed today, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, um, I so. think so. But it's also easily accessible by yeah. everybody and a uh, you don't have to call it virtue, but once you have these conversations, people light up all ages, you know, from three to a hundred. Yeah. You know, there, there's something that, that grabs and makes them smile. Just approaching people and asking them about their passions before all their problems. Um, yeah. So yeah. that the problems are put into context uh, that that's so, so needed. That, oh, that's a good, that's a really good way of putting it. I never thought about that, about prefacing, about how just that's a great tool to think about when addressing people. I mean, I think maybe mm. subconsciously I deploy it sometimes by trying mm. to be a more empathetic person, but I've never put it into words like actually maybe considering the person's plight before their, before, or kind of not, not even their plight, but yeah, what they're predisposed to, what the, everybody's human. That's a good, unique way of thinking about dialogue with another is that prefacing in your mind foremost that everybody struggles equally mm. with different facets of life that that could be a great tool just to employ meditatively mm. when you engage in conversation i think mm. indeed yeah all right well i don't want to keep you too much longer uh <laughs> I, I know i already kept you two hours late by uh not <laughs> well it, it worked world. out it, i work from home so um there's okay. just some other chores to do so as long as we connected that's all i was interested in. yeah, yeah. no absolutely i was as well. well i really appreciate it again dr kelly and uh I uh, will be looking forward to communicating with you in the future because I'm sure oh, that will happen. Yeah, I'd love to at any time. And um, yeah, there's so much we can talk about. And I'd have to say, you know, when I talked to you, was it a year or maybe a bit more ago, um, you, you're basically, you've grown. You were great then, by the way. Thanks. But you're probably through your interaction with so many interesting people, <laughs> you've got an amazing knowledge now um and also an amazing um i suppose manner manner of uh interviewing people so so uh, oh well thank you shows, very much. It really that, does. that means yeah. a lot to me thank you yeah <laughs> that's really yeah because uh, no i i appreciate the encouragement that means a whole lot to me yeah well keep doing what you're doing okay <laughs> absolutely absolutely i will certainly keep doing that and i will keep yeah. in touch thank you very much okay. again you take care. All right. I hope this worked for you. Okay. All the best. Bye. Yes, it worked just fine. Have a good one.